my goodness. Oh, God, you are so good. You are so good. We raise a hallelujah. We raise our voices, God. We raise our voices. The atmosphere, I think is what John said this morning. The atmosphere. It's been saturated this week in prayer. This place has been a place of, I, I can't even describe it, what God has been doing this week. And it's not just been a handful of people who showed up. There was around 30 people, some less and some more, but around 30 people this week that showed up crying out to God, hungering. God, we need you. We need you, Father. We need you. That, I, I said it a couple of times this week, it just showed me the hunger that is so deep in our body for more for more of God we're not satisfied why are we not satisfied because there's more we talked about that a little bit last week there's more there's more oh man Woo. we were talking right before service Donna and I just just the excitement just felt excitement this morning you know last week Sometimes you give, you, you pour your heart out and, and you give a message and you're not sure what happened with it, if anything happened with it. I, you know, any of our speakers, when you leave the stage, you go, did that even go anywhere? Did that even go, anything happen? But an individual came up to my husband after church and then I joined the conversation a few minutes later and he began to share what happened with him last week that Holy Spirit began working and began talking to him. And so I have invited Chase McGill to come up this morning and he is gonna share what God did in him last week. God, God did it, God did it. And I'm gonna hand the mic to him so we can stay social distance here. <laughs> it's been wiped down, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, to be honest, I'm a little nervous. I've never You're... been a public speaker, but God is good anyway. Yes. And I'm gonna trust that he's gonna get my words out to the right people in the right way. Um, I'll begin with an analogy. If fighting against, following Jesus is a swim against the current type life. If the river is going, we're swimming against the current. Culture is trying to push us back. In mid-2020, probably about March when COVID really hit and a lot of us ended up having to stay home, uh, I stopped swimming. And that wasn't a all at once conscious decision. Just, I didn't get online and watch the uh, services. I didn't hardly uh, read the word. I maybe got into the verse of the day every once in a while, just say, I need a little nibble or something, you know? But uh, yeah, I stopped swimming. And I came last week to church and was listening to Lori's message. And the, she had said, it, it, it wasn't the main part of her message, but it was a... Uh, talking about the Israelites and how God had warned them not to let the culture surrounding them define them, basically. Uh, I'd be paraphrasing a lot, but um, as soon as she said that, it was one of the clearest times I knew that God was speaking to me. And he said, that, that's you, kid. That's been you this year. And man, it, it, it hit my heart. And I... I went through the rest of the service and uh, decided, okay, I'm going to go up and ask for prayer. So I got got to Mike and uh, Lori joined in a bit, and she's the one that put the word repentance to it, which I hadn't thought thought of it that way, but that's what it was. It was turning from one way of thinking and one way of doing things to going towards God again. Mm. And I started thinking about it, like repentance kind of has a negative connotation outside of the, the church of believers, but maybe inside the church of believers too. Uh, but repentance isn't a scary word. Yeah. If you know who you're repenting to. Uh, and I've got a couple portions of scripture that show the heart of our Father 
towards repentant sons and daughters. Uh, in Luke 15, you'll find the parable of the prodigal son. And everyone, everyone here knows the gist of that story, right? Yes, okay. Uh, if you don't, it's in Luke 15. But the wayward son who had gone off and wasted his inheritance wakes up. And it says he comes to his senses because he wakes up in a, a pig slop. And uh, he decides, I'm going to go back to my father because even the servants at his house eat better than, than I do in their clothes. So he goes back. And it says, when the son was still a long way off, the father got up and ran to the son. The son was expecting to come and grovel to the father and ask for a place back in his house. But that's not the way God, who that father represents in that parable, feels about us. We turn to him. And while we're still a long way off, he runs to us and embraces us. And the second um, is in Matthew 18. And this is more between, between us believers and just people out in the world. And Peter asks the Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And I imagine he was thinking that would be a, just a, whoa, out of this world answer. Seven times. And Jesus told him, how about 77 times? And, and that shows the heart of our Father too. If we come with, with a heart of true repentance, no matter how many times we mess up, we don't surprise him. But if our heart is true in seeking him, He's always going to want us back, and He's going to wrap us up in His love. Yeah. So I just encourage anyone that maybe is feeling like you're not close to just turn to Him and start start coming back that way. He'll meet you. That's Thank good. you. That's good. That is so good. That is so good. i hand this to you, John. That was price of admission right there, wasn't it? Don't you love how the, the heart of the Father is towards His children? The heart of the Father to the children. He loves us. Behold, Jody, what manner of love is this? We had a long conversation last week about that, that word behold. That's so good, that's so good. Last week we talked about return. We talked about return, and that was what happened in Chase's life. We talked about what it's gonna look like in the church, but it's also the individual of returning to our first love, that passionate return. And today we get to go into the second part of this four-part series of this Roadmap to 2020. We're gonna be talking about four different R's. Last week was return. This week we're gonna talk about rebuild then there's re-engage, and then there's revival. And uh, I, the more I'm in this, the more I study, the more excited I get. And this week of prayer and fasting has been so good for me because it's just been like clarity of thought, which is what I have needed. And so it has been good for me. So uh, thank you, Nathan. I just love having him underscore. I could just sit there and just have him play the whole time. <laughs> If y'all see over here behind Pam, we have a Jenga game. I actually heard a podcast this week of a pastor from Pennsylvania, and, and he was talking about the Jenga game, and it as I listened to it, I went, oh my goodness, this goes so well with today's subject. Now, I don't know if you all can see it from over there because of this table, but this is a Jenga game. How many of y'all know what Jenga is? You have an understanding of what it is. For those who don't, I'll just give a small uh, description of it, but you build a tower. You can see this tower that's been built here with blocks, and each player takes a turn pulling a block from the tower. They can't pull from the top. They have to pull from a, a level that's underneath, and, and they want to try to pull it out without causing the tower to topple over. But what happens as each piece is being pulled out, the, the structure is starting to become a little shaky, a little unstable. 
And, and the, the, in the game, what happens is finally someone pulls a piece out. They have to do it one-handed. I don't know if I said that or not. They have to pull it out. And when that last person pulls it out and it topples down, that's the end of the game. And the winner is the last person to pull it out without it falling. And so today, I am going to be referring to this as the Jenga Tower of Life, because this really is a great analogy of our lives and how our lives are. There may be something that happens. Everything looks good. Everything looks firm. Of course, here we've got some pieces already pulled out of it. But everything looks stable. Everything looks good. But then something happens. Something happens or someone says something. And it's like a piece is being pulled out of our lives. And after this happens so many times, so many pieces being pulled out, we find ourselves starting to get a little shaky. We feel like things are getting ready to collapse on us. In fact, we may actually experience some areas in our lives where everything comes crashing down. Now, the name Jenga in Swahili means to build. I found that interesting this week. I was like, where did they get the name Jenga? But that's what it means, is to build. And as I was thinking about this game, and I was thinking about the pieces being pulled out, the one at a time, it's not usually in our life a whole big thing happening all at once. Sometimes it is, but it's usually little pieces, one at a time being pulled out from us. The Song of Solomon talks about it's the little foxes that spoil the vines. It's when it's many little things that causes destruction, that causes everything to fall apart in our lives. And that happens often to us. Now, if you look at this Jenga game that was built today, you can tell that it's on a pretty solid foundation. This stage is concrete underneath, and so you could probably, probably play this game for quite a while before everything comes toppling down. However, if you were to set this up, like outside, out in the, the grass somewhere, or you were to take it to the beach and you would try to, to play it on the beach, the, the foundation under it would not be level, it would be unstable, and what would happen? The thing would topple pretty quickly, right? Often, often, we have to revisit of where our foundation is built. What are we building our life on? What kind of foundation? Now, for some, this week, the events that happened in Washington, D.C., and I'm talking to both sides of the aisle. I'm not talking to any one group of people, so know that. I'm being very clear in that. But what happened caused a shaking. It caused an unsettling. And we have to revisit where is our foundation built? Is our foundation built in a political party? Is our foundation built in a person or in the government? Because I want to tell you, if that is where our foundation is built, we're going to be let down and everything's going to topple on us. Why? Because the word of the Lord tells us not to put our confidence in man or in world systems or in government. Yes, we want leaders who, who abide by biblical principles. We want that, but we need to make sure that our foundation is on the word of God and on Jesus Christ. For others, maybe you have just seen the, the small pieces coming out of your life with a slow eroding of your marriage or other relationships. Maybe 
In, in, in the thing of life, a piece was pulled out as you went to the doctor recently and you got a bad report and it was like one more piece being pulled out from you. And these one, these areas that at one time were stable, were sturdy, that felt good, you starting to feel like everything is getting ready to topple over in my life and I don't know what to do. But I want to offer hope. I always want to offer hope. And that is in Jesus Christ, again, on the foundation, we have hope. And as we go into this second part of this series, we're going to talk about the second R word, and that is the word rebuild. So let's stand, let's have a word of prayer. And then let's get into the word of God this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your presence that has been felt so strong this morning. We thank you, Lord God, for the word of God and for the promises of the Lord. We thank you that, Father, that this week has been a week of, of good things happening as we have pursued you, as we have been crying out in hunger for you. And I pray that this morning, that Father, the sweet fragrance of your presence will be in this place. Because Lord, the sweet fragrance has been here all week. And I pray that Lord, we'll all be touched with it. And that Lord, when we leave here, we are carrying that. And Lord, I pray that today as we are in this on rebuild that Lord, there's light bulb moments for all of us, that your Holy Spirit is speaking. I thank you, Lord God, for what you did with Chase last Sunday. We just say more, God, more. But God, I pray it, it's on all of us that we all reevaluate. We all look at our lives, Father, because Lord, we know there's more. We thank you again, God, for the word of the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And you can kind of high-five your neighbor without touching them or smile at them or wave or something like that. Now, last week we started a series um, from the book of Haggai. We've also been in Ezra. Last week I threw in a little bit of Jeremiah because it all is connected and it is so cool to put the pieces together to figure out that whole puzzle and the history and everything that was going on. For me, it's always interesting. I've, I've read the Bible through so many times and there have been it's only been recently, I feel like I've started connecting dots of how all of this goes. And that uh, is, is kind of what's going on in this series. But last week, we talked about the exiles who had been, they had been sent to Babylon ultimately because of the refusal to do things God's way. God warned them, listen, you don't do things my way, you're going to get into bondage. You see, sin entered, and when sin enters the camp, it's going to cause bondage. It's going to cause captivity. You're going to lose freedom. When we allow sin that is unchecked in our lives, that's what's going to happen. And so that is what is going on with the, the Israelites. Now, God, if you weren't here last week, I encourage you to watch, watch it online. If you weren't able to watch it online last week, go back and, and reread this because we are really kind of building a tower. We're building line upon line here. We're telling a story. And so you, if you watch next week or last week, you'll get more of an understanding of the return and what was going on. But last week, we talked about how they were in captivity and how uh, God had a plan the whole time. And God spoke to the prophet Jeremiah right before they were led off into captivity, and he said, you're going to be in captivity for 70 years. 
This is, this is what's going to happen. Now, God was just like to the point, 70 years you're going to be in captivity. But you will be returned back to Jerusalem. Now, you can find that. We talked about this last week in Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 14. But also, Jeremiah, I think it is uh, chapter 25, says the same thing. The Lord kept giving the same message. Because of your sins, you're going into captivity. But now we are coming right up to the 70-year mark. The time of captivity is coming to an end. And we start in Daniel chapter 9. Now, if you know, and, and get your version notes out, your Bible app, find us, follow us, because we've got all the scriptures in there. Or if you've got your Bible, turn to it, Daniel chapter 9. If you remember, Daniel was a man of prayer, right? Daniel was the one who was thrown into the lion's den because of praying. And he wasn't just a quiet prayer. He flew, flung open the windows and he prayed three times a day, even though it was against the law. He did it. We know he was thrown into the lion's den and how God spared his life. But not only was he a prayer, but he was also an influencer of those who were in government authority. He was an influencer to the king. He was an influencer to others that were in authority. So we pick up here in Daniel chapter 9, verses 2 and 3, and this is what he says. I, Daniel... Learn from reading the word of the Lord. And I got to stop right there. All week when I've read that, I've had to stop right there. Daniel, who was a deeply spiritual man, Daniel, who could interpret dreams, Daniel, who prayed, read the word of the Lord. If it was important for him to read the word of the Lord, guess what? It's important for us to read the word of the Lord. I thought, man, that would just preach right there. You just need, that's all I need to say. But he said he learned from reading the word of the Lord as revealed to Jeremiah, which we've talked about, the prophet, that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. So through the reading of God's word, Daniel became aware that the 70 years are just about up. And what was his response to knowing that the 70 years are just about up? He begins to fast and pray. And if you read the rest of Daniel chapter 9, you will see where he didn't just fast and pray. He began to repent for the sins of the people. You know, it would have been so easy for Daniel to have set back on his laurels and go, oh, God's given a promise, and I'm just going to sit back and watch him fulfill it. I'm going to eat my popcorn and watch it happen. But instead of doing that, he engaged with what God was doing. And that was the fulfillment of the promise of seeing the people return from bondage back to their homeland. He began to fast. He began to pray. And I believe because of that, that is what stirred the heart of Cyrus to return the people of God back to their homeland. And he returned them with one goal in, life, in mind, to rebuild the temple of God. Now, I said this last week. I want to say it again because I just love it so much. Cyrus, the Lord spoke to the prophet Isaiah around 150 years before Cyrus was even born. And Isaiah prophesied about him. And he said that Cyrus, who was not a godly man, who was not a follower of God, that he was going to do this great thing of returning, of returning the exiles back. And what I get out of that is when God gives a promise, his timeline may not be our timeline. His timeline may be a lot longer than what we want it to be. But when he gives a promise, he will fulfill that promise. And I want us to be encouraged with it. It may take longer than what you think it should take, but wait on God's timing for that thing to happen. So now, 
we pick up Ezra, finally, Ezra chapter one, verses one through three, and this is where it really starts getting good. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the promise he had given through Jeremiah. He stirred the heart of, of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any of you who are his people may go to Jerusalem in Judah to rebuild this temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, who lives in Jerusalem, and may your God be with you. So I was reading that scripture this week. I had one of those what I call light bulb moments. Y'all have heard me talk about that before. That word stirred, jumped out at me. And uh, I've read it and I read it and I've learned that when I have kind of those like, oh wow, that, what does that mean? I mean, it's stirred. What's so, what's so significant about that word? Well, I went and began to dig to find out, well, what is significant about that word? If you go into the original Hebrew, it means to arouse, to awaken. So here's what I want us to get out of this. Through the prayer and the fasting of Daniel, for the repenting of Daniel, the Lord began to awaken the heart of Cyrus to the things of God, that something needed to happen, that now was the time. Something is getting ready to happen. So his heart was stirred, and awakening for the things of God began to come about, and the temple to be rebuilt. Oh my goodness. That gets me excited. I don't know if that does anything for you. The time is now for awakening. What we did this week in prayer and fasting can cause a stirring to happen, to ha an awakening to happen in us for the things of God, for the direction. It's, it's time to move. It's time to go forward. So how does this apply to us today? You see, some breakthroughs, some changes, some awakenings happen only through prayer and fasting. And Jesus even said this in Matthew chapter 17, verse 21. He said that in context, he said that there are some spirits that can only be driven out by prayer and fasting. But right before that, he talks about having the faith the size of a mustard seed. And he says, nothing is impossible. And then he says, some things only happen by prayer and fasting. That is what we were doing this past week. You see, fasting causes the flesh to come under the authority of God's spirit. I'm speaking to my flesh and I'm saying, come under the authority of Jesus Christ. You don't have rule over me. You have to come under authority. When we fast meals, we're saying, body, and it's hard, body, you don't need that food. You need Jesus. For me, this week, I'll just give this example just because sometimes we need examples of, of how this works or what to do. But I came off of social media. I tried to get back on it after this week was off, and I'm like, oh, I'm not so crazy about it and got right back off of it. But for me... It was so easy before to just hit that, that app, that Facebook app, and, and begin to just spend hours, or not hours, but a lot of time just looking at stuff. And what I began to do this week, and I shared this several weeks ago, I did this before, that when my finger wanted to go to that app, instead I went to the Word of God. Instead of filling my mind with all this other stuff, and there's good stuff on there too, don't get me wrong, there is good stuff, but instead of just filling my mind and my spirit with all of this, I began to fill my mind and my spirit with the word of God. I have gotten really far ahead in my daily reading because my finger kept trying to go to that Facebook app, and so I kept going to the word of the Lord. <laughs> 
It was good. It was good. And so I brought my flesh under the authority of Jesus Christ. And when we effectively fast, the God of heaven can come in and transform our circumstances, bring an awakening, stir hearts, bring deliverance, and then he can come in and also work in those places that have fallen down. God calls us to fast and pray. And I'm talking to myself when I say this. We don't do it enough. As a body, I'm so thankful that we, we do it at least once a year. But there are times God is calling us individually to do it, to begin to fast and pray, to begin to seek him and fill ourselves with him instead of whatever it is that we have decided to give up. God didn't only stir and awaken the heart of King Cyrus. He began to stir and awaken the hearts of the priests and Levites and all of the leaders of the Jewish nation. If you'll give me the liberty to say this, we can say he stirred the heart of the church. And the, the stirring was to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple of the Lord. That's Ezra 1.5. If you can imagine, many of them, they, they were settled there. They were comfortable there. They had been there for 70 years. Some had not known anything else except for living there in bondage, basically, in Babylon. And they were comfortable. But through the prayer... And through the fasting, the Lord began to stir the hearts. He stirred the heart of the king and he began to stir the hearts of the church. I'm going to give, give, give me liberty there to say that. He stirred the heart of the church to say, now is the time. Now is the time. Now is the time for the promise to be fulfilled. He began to nudge them. Let's go. Let's go. He began to rock the boat. That's something God has to do with me a lot of times. He begins to rock the boat. I see you laughing, Chase. He begins to rock the boat with me. Lori, you're getting uncomfortable. You got to get uncomfortable because I know you. You're putting your heels in. You're holding on with both hands. And God says, now is the time to do what I have called you to do. So he stirs and he awakens us. That is part of what happened this week during the prayer and fasting. There was an awakening, I believe, that started that we will be the church that God God has called us to be in this time for this moment. <sighs> Preach with me. <laughs> All right. All right, now hang on to your seatbelts, fasten your seatbelts. All right. But not only had they been stirred and awakened, but in Ezra 3.1, it says that they were unified in purpose. There was unity. There was unity that happened. And church, I want to say this, before we can do fully what God has called us to do, there's got to be unity. I think we could say that a little bit louder, amen. <laughs> before we can do what God has fully called us to do, not just our body, the church universal, there needs to be unity. You see, disunity can cause our tower to collapse. You see, each part is in a place doing what it needs to do to make this tower strong. And when like we said earlier, when a piece is taken out or, or if it's not in there just right, it will cause this thing to topple. And Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 12, about us being the body of Christ and we each have our part. We each have our place, but we've got to work together to be the full body of Christ. And if we're not in our place, if we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, if the toe is telling the eye that he He's more important than, than, he, than the eye is. There, there's disunity and it's not functioning the way it needs to. So the Lord is calling us to unity. For the past year, 
in my lifetime, and I know there's always been times of, of unrest and things that have happened, but in my lifetime, I have seen more, you have seen more disunity in this last year than ever before in our nation and in our churches. I was going there, but you're right. The politics, the race relations, COVID, and on and on and on. And not only has it affected our nation and our world, it has affected the church. And I'm not just talking CLC, okay? But if we're not mindful, if we're not watching, it could permeate our church just as much. What has happened? (laughs) What has happened? I watch on social media, think, I, I'm, just, I'm thankful that this was a week that I was off of social media. I've said that to several people of all weeks to choose to get off. I think this was a good time to do that. But I have watched as believers, people who are Christ followers, people who say, follow me as I follow Christ, post stuff that is not... Not God honoring, uh, the memes that are not pointing people to Jesus, the articles that they post without fact checking them. And I, I, listen, if you walk me out the door today, okay, but I'm just going to say it like it is. If we are not fact checking what we are posting, we are spreading lies. That's all there is to it. And we, even as believers, this has happened. We are doing that. And so what is going on is that division, that that stuff that we are posting is even causing division within the church. Now, we have our own opinions. I get it. It's okay. This is a free country, and I am so thankful for free speech. Know that. Please understand that. I'm not trying to to keep you from having free speech, but I also believe there's wisdom. There is wisdom, and when Holy Spirit says, "Uh uh-uh, you don't need to do it, then guess what? We don't need to do it. I have read the comments the arguments between believers on social media. And through this, and it's not just on social media, I've seen it in person as well. I just keep going back to social media because that has such a big part of our lives. But the comments and and the arguments, and I have seen some long-standing friendships. I've seen this more than once long-standing friendships that have been totally severed because of the division that has entered our culture and we've allowed it to enter the church. God, help us. You know why I told you to fasten your seatbelt? Because this is a hard word. But we need to know the truth and we need to stop giving in or being a part of the division that has happened. Jesus said this, they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. I may not totally agree with you, but I'm going to love you. I'm going to love you. Why? Because I'm a disciple of Jesus. And, and we, we've got to have unity. Paul says in um, Romans chapter 12, live in harmony with each other. And, and, and I love this. I underlined this in my notes. If you've got your U version, if you can underline it, highlight it, do this, because this is, this, this is so, so today. And don't think you know it all. Don't think you know it all. Yes, we all have opinions, but guess what? Our opinions may not be correct. 
He says, don't think you know it all and never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable. What we are posting, what we are sharing, what we are saying, are we reflecting Jesus? Are we reflecting Jesus, reflecting people back to Jesus? Paul says, make sure that everyone can see you're honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. So one of the first steps of rebuilding, well, we've already talked about being stirred and awakened and all of that, but it's also being unified in purpose of what God has called us to do. Being unified and having unity in our friendships, our marriages, our church. We need one another. Your homework this week (laughs) is to go home and read scriptures on unity. Google it. What are scriptures on unity? And begin to read it. I need to do it just as well. I, I will say this. I am not pointing a finger at anyone. I'm talking to myself as well on this. I believe as we begin to read the scriptures on unity, the Holy Spirit will begin to reveal truth to us and there will be an understanding there, more of an understanding. And before we end today's service, at the end, we are going to be praying for unity. We've been praying this all week, but we're going to be praying for unity in our country and for our leaders and for the church, that there is unity and there are there is no division. So with stirred hearts and in unity, work finally began on the temple of the Lord. And you will see that in Ezra 3 verses 7 through 9. And it says this, When the builders completed the foundation of the Lord's temple, the priests put on their robes and took their places to blow their trumpets. And the Levites, descendants of Asaph, and if we ever do a teaching on worship, I gotta stop there, side side note, squirrel. If we ever do a teaching on worship, Asaph is a great one to do a teaching. He was one of the worship leaders put in charge of worship at David when David built the tabernacle and put the, the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant in there. But they, they were descendants of Asaph, back to this, this scripture, clashed their symbols to praise the Lord, just as King David had prescribed. With praise and thanks, they sang this song to the Lord. He is so good. His faithful love for Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout, praising the Lord, because the foundation of the Lord's temple had been laid. After 70 years, the Babylonians, when they came in, they totally destroyed the temple and after 70 years of it laying desolate they returned and they were able to begin work finally and the the foundation was laid and there was rejoicing and there was excitement and I'm sure they were singing some of the old songs of look what the Lord has done and they were just rejoicing in that but it says that mingled with the excitement and the rejoicing, Ezra writes, but many of the older priests, Levites, and other leaders who had seen the first temple wept aloud when they saw the new temple's foundation. The others, however, were shouting for joy. The joyful shouting and weeping mingled together in a loud noise that could be heard far in the distance. So why? were they weeping? This was a great thing that was going on. Why were they weeping? Why were they crying? Because as this foundation was being laid, these older Levites remembered what the temple had been like under Solomon. They remembered the old days and the grandeur and the beauty and the gold. They remember all that. They remember that at the dedication of the temple, that the glory of the Lord came down as a cloud into the place and the presence of God was so tangible. They remembered that. And when they looked at this new foundation to them, it didn't look anything the same. It didn't look like the same. 
came. And what was happening was they were missing the new that God was doing. The new that God was doing. You see, when you rebuild something, when you do a rebuild, you have the opportunity to come in and, and make corrections or do things differently or, or maybe there's new technology that wasn't there before. There's new things that can happen. I know this week Donna uh, talked about the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the grocery store here in, Mar or in Heron, the old grocery store that has sat vacant for, uh, for quite a while that they've, they've been tearing it down. And I, I guess they're going to be building a new building there. Is that correct? I had not heard that. I just saw they were tearing it down. Do what? Oh, what? Okay. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> But this, this building has sat vacant for years, and, and, and I'm sure there's deterioration. I'm sure this thing was crumbling, and, and I even know when it was actually a business, it, I didn't enjoy going into that building because of the, the smell, the atmosphere, whatever. And so it probably really needed to come down so that something new, something better could come in its place. You see, the same is true in our lives as well. Maybe you are in a place of rebuilding some areas of your life, rebuilding some crumbled and fallen places. That Jenga game, I love it. And you feel like, if I, I, I'm just going to keep doing it the same way I did it before. I'm going to make it look like it did before, but that's the problem. That's what got you into that situation, probably in the first place. And it may require in the rebuilding, in the changes, some behavioral changes, some discipline. There's a, um, I've been told, I should have verified this, but I've been told that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. <laughs> it's not going to happen. You keep doing the same thing over and over again, you're going to keep getting the same results. We need to change. We need to change. We need to do things differently. We do need to do things new. In fact, our God is not one who is stagnant. Our God doesn't call us to the rut. I'm calling you there, and I want you to stay there and not move and let everything become stagnant. That's not what God calls us to. God does not call us to that. God is always doing something different. He doesn't use the same methods. He doesn't use the same formulas. We, on the other hand, like to do the same methods and the same formulas because we don't like change. And, and this produced it over here. And God says, no, I'm doing something new. I'm doing something different. Just, just follow me. Follow me and what I have. In fact, many times we try to put God in a box this is the way it's been this is the way it's always been and that's the way it's always got to be that's the way we are but Isaiah 43 tells us that God he says I'm doing a new thing and what we need to do is be careful that we don't miss the new thing because we're so caught up in the old I'm just going to sit there for a minute. It's got to kind of simmer. We've got to be careful that we don't miss the new thing because we are so caught up in the old. Let's be careful in doing that. So for us here at CLC, I told you last week this is a roadmap for CLC, but also for us individually. I celebrate our past. Oh my goodness, I celebrate our past. We have a rich heritage. We have a wonderful past. And I honor every person, every leader who has gone before, who has had a significant part of this body of getting us where we are now because we couldn't have done it without their sacrifice, without their wisdom, without their leadership. 
I celebrate that. But let's not lose sight of the new thing he wants to do. Last week when I talked about returning to our roots, I hope I communicated it clearly that I am not interested in making things look the same as it did 45 years ago. I'm not interested in that. Again, God is doing a new thing. What I am interested in is the roots that this church was founded on. It was the hunger of God, the hunger for his word, the knowledge of his word, a hunger for the moving of the Holy Spirit because there was a realization back in the 70s that there was more than what individuals were getting from where they were and they wanted more, they wanted more, they wanted more. And that is what I, I'm talking about of getting back to our roots, a hunger. But what does rebuild look like for CLC this year? Well, because of COVID, I think John said this earlier about our life groups, it's all kind of looked different and, and different ministries, it just, everything looks different. I mean, you can look around and, and, and then there's just pockets that are not filled with people and we get that. That's, that's not a, a condemning word. We understand that, that people are, are staying home many times just for precaution and I get that. But this is a time to begin to reevaluate, reassess. Are there new ways of doing ministry that we've never thought about doing them? I told you January of 2020, I didn't think there would be cameras in this room. And now look at us a year later, there's cameras everywhere. That's a new way of doing ministry. But we will reevaluate some ministries. I'm working, I am and will be working with our staff about looking at our individual ministries and departments. Is there a way we can do things differently? Is there something that isn't working? Maybe it's become obsolete. Maybe this is, this is done. It was just for a season. I don't know. And, and just to put everyone's mind at ease, the elders will know everything, so it's all good. We'll be okay with it. And we have other ministries that are growing, that are doing. We just need to pour a little more fuel on them to see them continue to grow so that we can stay current. This technology my goodness, that changes almost daily. That will be something that we are going to have to stay on top of. Who would have thought, I said this earlier, that we would have cameras in this room, but not only do we have cameras in this room, but we are on Spotify and Pandora and iHeartRadio and Napster and I don't know what else we're on, streaming audio. Who would have thought that? But things are changing even in that industry, in that area, and we will need to reassess those things. That is part of the new thing, that we don't get stuck in a rut and we continue to seek God. But one scripture that has stayed with me since September of last year when the Lord just began to give me the four R's, the one scripture that has stayed with me is Psalms 127.1 and it says, unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Know this. I remember, and we always will remember, that this church is not built on a person or a personality. This is his house. This is his church. We continually seek the Lord. I choke. I've choked with the elder several times. I'm like, yeah, me and Jesus, we have a lot of conversations. <laughs> I have to. I have to. I can't do it without him. And I don't want to do it without him. This is his house. And we want to be in step with what he is doing. And he allows us, he allows us to be in step with him, to see work accomplished for rebuilding to happen in the areas that it needs to happen. So this morning, I want us to stand. I've carried, I, I have covered a lot of territory this morning. <laughs> I talk about our foundation. Is it a time to reassess where our foundation is? 
Is our foundation on anything other than Jesus Christ? We need to reassess. I've talked about the little pieces being pulled out of our lives. Whether it's life happening, the attack of the enemy, or just relationships falling apart. Are there little pieces that are falling out? I talked about the fasting and praying that leads to awakening. I've, I've covered a lot of stuff today and I pray the Holy Spirit has used something to talk to all of our hearts. And I'm pointing to myself too, that he is speaking to my heart just as much. I've talked about unity in our country with our leaders and with the church, that there not be division, that there is unity. And I've also talked about being ready to rebuild the new thing that God is doing, the new places he wants to take us. So this morning, like I said, I just covered a whole bunch of stuff. Maybe you've got a different need. Maybe none of that even applied to you. But you said, I came in here with something else. Maybe it was healing. Maybe it's a financial need. I don't know. But if any of this, any of this, or you have any other need applies to you, I just want you to raise your hand and allow us to pray over you. And I'm inviting John to come up here and I've asked him to actually pray over unity in our country with our leaders and with the church so i'm going to pray first john and then i'm going to let you have it and i'm going to leave the stage with that but father lord god there's so much there's so much of your word that father i just I, it was just so much but god i know that you're speaking to us because you long for us father you long for us to be a restored people, not a people where our lives are falling apart like this game over here, Father, but our lives are, are positioned on the strong foundation of Jesus. And Lord, I pray for those, the God who may be in that place where pieces are being pulled out, broken relationship, a bad doctor's report, different things are being pulled out. And Lord, they feel like everything is getting ready to fall down on them God today we pray we pray that Lord they're going to be shored up that your word that your spirit is working father in their lives bringing restoration bringing wholeness God bringing wholeness Lord I pray God that our eyes are on you and not on anything else on you alone and not on anything else that our foundation is on you, is in you, and your word, and nothing else. God, it's so easy to get, get our eyes on everything else that's going on. It's just easy. And I pray that, Lord, today our foundation is secure in you. Our lives are secure as our lives are built on the foundation of you. And I pray, Lord, today that if you, you're calling us to a new thing, that we don't miss it. That we don't miss it, God, because we're so hard holding on to the, the old way of doing things. That, God, we will grasp, we will go after change when your hand is involved with it. We thank you, Lord. God, today I pray there is healing. I pray there's provision. I pray for peace of mind. I pray, Lord God, that your light shines in the darkest places, God, bringing hope and joy and peace, Father. John. The Holy Spirit is so good.